I am uh, bringing you information today that the average speaker that comes could not bring. But my relationship with you goes to the very earliest days of your existence. I remember when on the docks I had rented one of the warehouses, the abandoned warehouses, and I held a meeting. And your pastor, both of them came, Brother Kong and his good wife, sister, sister, son, they came with a little envelope. And they brought it to me and they said, everything we have is in this envelope. Twenty-four hundred sing dollars. The little mascara was running down little sunshine's face. As she stood there, they both whipped and said, we must have your anointing for finance because God has given us a vision to take the world for Jesus Christ. And it has been so. That anointing has come. But please know when big anointings come, big enemies come. Large enemies rise up. But know this, that in an open heaven, under an open heaven, there is no enemy that can stand before the great God Jehovah. Oh, hallelujah. Catch these things. Get them in your spirit. I speak now to a church that has sent a whole new kind of financial structure to churches all over the world. When I came here first, tithing was almost, almost extinct in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand what the tithe is? 10% of everything that God puts into your hands, everything that comes into your hands, that 10% belongs to the Lord. I tell you this, when I first came, I began to teach tithing. And pastors, they took a hold of it and said, John, what can we do? And you remember the little books that came out, the 12, 24 little books. And those of you that have been here a long time, you remember as the church was building the power of tithing in your midst, every month all the tithers got a little booklet, got a little booklet. 24 books went out, and there came a point where 97% tithers at City Harvest Church in Singapore. Never been heard of before. Never heard of before. As I traveled the world and brought the message of tithing back into the church, the renaissance of tithing, you were the poster child. I said, it's happening in Singapore. Don't say it can't happen. It's happening at City Harvest in Singapore. They are 97% tithers plus. And then in one place, there comes 97% tithers. In another place, 97% tithers. Just this last year in Bandung, I was there and I spoke in the great church in Bandung. And I used you as an illustration that you can have 97% tithers in a church. And a church can operate under an open heaven. Have any of you ever been disappointed? I was disappointed the first of this last week, when I heard that we're no longer 97% tithers. Tithing has dwindled in this church. The great city harvest now is not leading in tithing. A young church in Bandung, 97%. A church over in San Diego, 97%. A church in uh, Dallas, Texas, 97% plus, but no longer here at the model church for that church. I come as a father, and sometimes fathers come to bring presents and to be happy, happy time. Other times fathers come to take and bring the children back where God. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? Now, please understand, I can't talk like this to most churches. Most countries, I can't talk like this because they're not as smart as a Singaporean. The Singaporean understands exactly what you say. You don't have to say it twice. You understand it. And I am here in the, in the love of God. But I am bringing you a stern word. Something has changed here. But hear this. You folks are looking for the biggest miracle of any church in the world. Hear me. No church in the world is anticipating the size miracle that you're anticipating. And it cannot come to a closed heaven church. The heaven must be opened over this house. It's imperative that the heaven be opened. 
All of your hopes and your dreams will be shattered soon if we don't get to heaven open again over this great church of City Hall. Is anybody hearing what the man of God is saying to you today? Has to be a move. In the book of Genesis, when you come to the second chapter and you're in the 15th verse, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now hear this, to dress it and to keep it. He wasn't there on vacation. He was working in that garden, keeping that garden. He put him there to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou must freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, you will not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. God put Adam and Eve in that beautiful garden, and he said, all the trees, everything here, all the good things here, they are yours. Enjoy them. See them. But you're going to have to labor. You're going to have to see that the fertilizer is there, that the soil is proper. You're going to have to see that the pruning is done. You're going to have to see. To, now, eat all you want. But the fruit of your labor, just eat all you want. But there's one tree. There's one tree in the midst of that garden. You will bestow your labor on that tree. You will prune the tree. You will have to do with that tree, but you will not be allowed to eat the fruit from it. It is the Lord's portion. It stays. Your labor is put on it, but you do not take and eat the benefit of it. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying to you? When you work on your job and they pay you for the year, for the, for the, for the week, they don't say, oh, are you a tither? Oh, yes, you tither. You don't have to work 10%. Because you don't get the money, it goes to the church. You're not going to have, so you don't have to show up for 10% of the time. You bestow labor on every hour of your paycheck, but 10% of it belongs to the Lord. Do not become confused that maybe God, some way, is just all of a sudden trying to muscle into your business like some mafioso boss. No, no, no. In the Garden of Eden, please notice, it says, and God planted a garden in Eden. He did not create the Eden Garden. He planted it. So the seed that went in the ground was his seed. And the apple tree today that the farmer has apples from in the archer, he owes God for the seed that started the apple kingdom, that started the orange kingdom. In the earth, in the bowels of the earth, there are ores, there are diamonds, there's minerals. All of those are put there by God. And now as they're used, God says, use it freely, enjoy it, make it bigger, make it more wonderful. But remember, there's a portion that belongs to me. That was not given in the Mosaic law. That started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And then the first violation of God's portion took place in those early days. Genesis 4, 3 and 4. In the process of time, please catch that. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had no respect. What is the situation here? Is it mean that you can't bring fruit to the, to, in an offering? If you're a farmer, what do you have to do? It says at the fullness of time. The season had now closed, and all the fruit was rotten. It had now gone past the ripe stage, and he brings rotten fruit. God said, uh, excuse me, David said, I will not offer to God that which cost me nothing. And Abel's offering, look at it, the firstlings and the best. The firstlings and the best he brought to the Lord. Listen, this thing about the tithe has gone on for from the beginning of time, it has been an issue. Cain, the priest of the household. Now listen to this. The priest of the household, the firstborn in Adam's family, the priest came against tithing. And today we have priests all over the earth teaching that it's not a day to tithe. Child of God, I'm not talking to you about a mosaic situation. I'm talking to you about a divine principle that's been in God's creation from the very beginning. And now we travel across time into the time of the Mosaic Law. And they incorporated the tithe. And then it went on. And I bring you now to 35 years after the resurrection, still tithing going on in the church. 
Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, saith the Lord of hosts, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Watch with me, please, the word blessing. The word blessing is not like usual. It's not nice little things that come out through the windows of heaven for you. It, 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 here's what the word actually means. Word for word from, the, from Thayer's dictionary, from Strong's dictionary on the Greek language, the invocation of God, the results of which is prosperity and good of every kind. What is it saying? Invocation. How many times have people spoken blessings over this house? How many times have people prophesied victories over this house? All of those are invocations of good. But when the tithe opens heaven again, these invocations begin to come to pass. The things that were spoken to you by those great men of God that stand in your pulpit and speak words of prophecy to you. Things that your pastor has spoken that's coming into the future. These all are ready to pour back into your midst. But church, I cannot go home in peace. I cannot go home to my nation and lay down in peace at night knowing that the heaven isn't open here. Because, church, do you realize that for five years the angels of heaven have been looking over the banister of heaven and they're focused on Singapore? Because the future of so many churches, the future of so many nations are hanging in the balance of this church remaining the powerhouse that God has for it to be. You say, Brother John, our number has dwindled. Listen, when Samson walked in, Samson didn't walk in like a bodybuilder. Samson walked in just like me, just a regular guy. But the power of God was in him. And gates were thrown to one side. The jawbone of an ass became like an atomic bomb as Philistines fell everywhere. It has absolutely nothing to do with your size of your group. It has to do with the size of the door in heaven that you have open. <laughs> Hallelujah. I come with a release. I come with Malachi, the third chapter. I quickly take one other moment. The revelation that I just gave you, I give you the story. I was coming to the building, the Hollywood building, and I asked God, I, I was traveling in the back of the airplane at that time in, in, in coach, and I would study, but my books would be between my knees, and I said, God, give me one seat on one side or the other empty so that I can put my books, because I didn't sleep during those times. I studied. I wrote books. I studied. I wrote books. I said, God, I must have an answer. I go to Singapore and I must launch this tithing campaign. Tell me what there is really in this message that you have in Malachi 3. When I got on the plane, they seated me in my seat from the bathrooms here to the bathrooms behind me. No one was in that, pla in that airplane. I said, where is everyone at? <laughs> the connection from New York missed and did not come. And the connection from Houston missed and did not come. And we are having to go. We can't wait any longer for them. God gave me the whole middle of a 747 to come with this answer 